Um, as you said, I'm, I'm not an immunologist, I'm not a medical doctor, I am a humble pharmacist, and what we do is we try to formulate um, medicines in a way that they can act where they are supposed to be acting. And uh, in this regard, we've been working a lot in the field of nanomedicine, that's how this collaboration with you came, came about. And um, in this regard, we also were looking at, for several reasons, I will try to make um, clear during my presentation, <clears throat> we also looked at uh, nanotechnology for the formulation of new vaccines and new adjuvants. Actually, my, my presentation will be, will be subtitled as a glimpse into the scary world of vaccine adjuvants. Why are vaccine adjuvants so scary? Now, as Janeway, Professor Janeway, said a long time ago in 89, <clears throat> the uh, adjuvants are the immunologists' the dirty little secrets. That's what you put into your vaccines in order to make them more uh, antigenic, a little more uh, activating the immune system. Now, Janeway uh, said that in 1989. And um, since then, you know, people have been working with, with adjuvants which were not very specific, which interacted with the immune system in a rather undefined way. Now, <clears throat> what people have been thinking is to make this a little more rational, to go into very specific pathways and very specific interactions with um, the immune system and with receptors of the immune system um, foremost of the um, receptors of the innate immune system. Now, if you look into this, how can you make vaccines effective? Maybe one could look at what makes, oops, what makes viruses immunogenic. How are viruses recognized by the immune system? What are the uh, mechanisms uh, involved in this? So, or more or less, you can ask yourself the question, if drugs are similar or even identical with respect to the structure and mechanism of action of MOA to endogenous substances. There's all the uh, discussion about therapeutic proteins, biosimilars, and so forth. Then if this is the case, why can't we make delivery systems, meaning formulation of these medical principles, resemble their natural counterparts as well? And I can only hope you can hear me over this and understand me, because I can't hear myself anymore. So the question is, what makes viruses immunogenic? So viruses. Viruses are nature's best and, of course, worst delivery systems when it comes to efficacy of infecting a patient, of delivering RNA or DNA. Viruses are very effective. So why, what are the mechanisms involved in this? And here are just some, some thoughts on this. Um, how um, viruses manage to be such good um, vaccines or can be good transmitters of diseases. First of all, you have this uptake by antigen presenting cells or APCs, which depends on the shape, the size, the surface charge, receptor interactions between the viruses and these, these cells because viruses are immunogenic because they are particles, they are recognized as foreign particles. This uptake again, then triggers the maturation of dendritic cells, trafficking to lymph nodes and T cell activation, so all this activation of the immune cells. And also, direct interaction with B cells, triggering antibody response, so an uptake of particulate antigen may lead to cross-presentation, which is absent in soluble antigen, so this may even be <coughs> another advantage of, of these particulate viruses. So one reason why viruses are immunogenic is that they're particles of a certain size, shape, and they can interact with the immune system in different ways. Now, viruses, they are very primitive. They have limited uh, genetic information, which is then translated into a repertoire of some proteins. So they show on their surface, some of them, have limited genetic information for proteins, so their viral surface is quasi-crystalline, which means they have repetitive subunits. And this surface um, properties, these surface properties can direct, interact with B cells, break intolerance, show that there is something that's antigenic and so forth. Now, viruses do replicate, 
So this is also one reason why viruses are immunogenic. You have a sustained antigen exposure over longer periods of time, which means that the induction of the T cell memory that you induce by this infection, hopefully, is important at reinfection. And the longer you have this uh, sustained antigen exposure, that's one of the things I learned, is that you have a larger T cell memory pool here. T cell pool, memory pool is dependent on the duration of the exposure to the antigen. So if you translate this into something like a delivery system for an antigen, uh, like a, maybe an artificial virus, you would like to have your nanoparticle, your microparticle stay in the host long enough and release the antigen over longer periods of time. Now, and of course, viruses activate the innate immune system, meaning they interact with certain pattern so-called pathogenic pattern recognition receptors. These are receptors that have evolved uh, during the evolution, have been also um, present in many cells, uh, for instance, in, in antigen-presenting cells, dendritic cells, and so forth. And one of these families of these pathogenic pattern recognition receptors, part of the innate immune uh, system are these toll-like receptors that have been discovered uh, recently over a longer period of time. Um, they are the first line of defense against inf infection because these toll-like receptors, or these PRR, pattern recognition receptors, are <coughs> can recognize antigenic um, structures on first contact. They don't have to be primed. They don't have to be uh, prepared for this. They can um, recognize these antigenic uh, or pathogenic patterns from the first infection on. And there is a bridging to the adaptive immune system. So the innate immune system is the first line of defense, if you want, against infection. And then it activates the adaptive immune system to get memory, um, immune memory in the end. Now, if we look at this closely, <coughs> you have here um, a cell. You have different um, toll-like receptors, which are, for instance, these pattern recognition receptors, which are expressed on the on the surface of these cells, on the epithelial surface, or even within intracellular uh, vesicles, like in the endosomes. So meaning that here you have a, uh, have a defense against pathog pathogens on the surface of the cells, so the extracellular space, if you want. And here, after infection, after intracellular infection, there's also some toll-like receptors which are expressed in the endosomes to fight off the infection after the infection of the cells has, has occurred. There's some more here. There's uh, the NOT1-2 receptors that are intracellularly in the cytoplasm, plus, um, located in the cytoplasm, and some other stuff that can activate the immune system. Here you have alum, one of the most um, used uh, uh, adjuvants, uh, which is thought to activate the inflammasome here, which you see on this side. So all of this <coughs> are just examples how adjuvants may uh, activate the immune system. Now, I, we concentrated more or less on interactions of our delivery systems with toll-like receptors, and recently also with NOT2 receptors. Now, let me tell you a little story on these toll-like receptors, TLR. This is uh, Mrs. nusslein um, who was very happy because um, she got a Nobel Prize for, because the first as far as I know, the first um, representative of these family of toll-like receptors was um, di discovered in her lab. And I don't know how good your German is, but toll doesn't have anything. Toll doesn't have anything to do with the fee you pay once you get on the Autoroute or something. Toll is a German word for excellent, great. The story is that I heard was that in the lab they discovered the first receptor of this family. And they were so happy about this, and because it was in Germany, they said, oh, this is toll. This is great. Nobody verified this. And I was on a blog uh, in the internet, so on LinkedIn, and some people came up with a question, is this story really true? And I said, I want to confirm this. So I wrote to Mrs. Nüsslein Vollhardt an email. Uh, she's still there, I think, at Göttingen, at the uh, M Max Planck in Göttingen. And I, I asked her, you know, Dear professor, could you please tell me? And her answer was, stimmt so ungefähr, uh, quite about right. So she confirmed this. And I have this email in my office <laughs> at the wall. So it was really great. So this 
this, the story of these um, toll-like receptors went on and on. There are many more being discovered. And uh, here you probably see a recent uh, illustration of these pathogenic recognition receptors with uh, the respective ligands for these receptors like lip lipoprotein or LPS for TLR1 and TLR2 who form these dimers. Um, we were working with MPL, you see here, for TLR6. <coughs> we're mostly working for TLR2 receptors. TLR7 uh, recognizes uh, single-stranded RNA after infection, as I said, uh, after uptake into the lysosomes. D TLR3 uh, recognizes uh, double-stranded RNA, viral RNA, and so forth. CPG here, bacteria, DNA, CPG DNA, is recognized by TLR9. So this gives you the possibility to interact quite specifically with receptors of the immune system in order to activate this immune system in what way whatsoever. So we took our chances there, and um, like many other groups, of course, we looked at this. So <clears throat> these are toll-like receptor agonists, insoluble aluminum salts, uric acid crystals potentially activate the inflammasome, as I said. We are working also with a, a polymer, chitosan, which is very famous these days. Everybody's working on this as a polymer for making particles for drug delivery systems. But, but there are also more and more dipeptide MDP, uh, which is a ligand for the NOT2, which is intracellular pathogen, uh, pathogenic pattern recognition receptor, and so forth. Poly-IC for TLR3, LPS TLR4, um, and so forth. So there's a lot of uh, things um, under um, discovery and under um, examination these days in the preclinical phase. In the clinical phase and on the market is actually this MF59 or squalene which is, a, I think, a TLR4 ligand. So it's squalene, this has been developed by a pharmaceutical company, is now used in different um, uh, flu vaccines. So <clears throat> what we're, we're looking at specifically was mucosal immunization. That means we want to immunize patients against infection um, by giving the vaccine to the mucosa. There are several advantages to this, um, but also several disadvantages. The advantages would be that you do not have to use a needle or injection to apply these, um, these vaccines, which, of course, in, in developing countries is a big problem. If you have all these, these sharps, these needles, they have to be <clears throat> somehow then destroyed, and sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes these needles are being reused. In fact, um, I think the majority of hepatitis cases in developing countries is due to the reuse of needles for, in for uh, injections of, uh, for instance, uh, vaccines. So if you could avoid the, the use of needles to apply a vaccine, that would be very nice. And then if you would only inhale or swallow or whatever a vaccine, you could do this yourself. So you don't need necessarily trained personnel for this. The downside of all, this, all of this is that we do not have too many uh, mucosal vaccines that are actually on the market. Actually, we, I don't think we have any. So um, there's a problem, and there's a toxicity problem, and we have to find out whether to come up with safe adjuvants for mucosal immunization. And then again, the, the second disadvantage is that mucosal surfaces are usually quite tolerant against uh, infection. They have to be because you're mucosal surfaces, lung, nose, uh, GI, GI tract, and so forth, are used to interact or being exposed to, to particles, to pathogens, and so forth, and they can deal with this. Now, if you come with a vaccine in order to, to uh, vaccinate or immunize against something, you might run into tolerance, you might run into these um, mechanisms of avoidance of uh, actually an, an immune response. So, um, as I said, TLRs are pattern recognition uh, receptors. They are present on diverse cell types, not only immune cells, but also epithelial cells. Recognize specific molecular patterns. And these, <coughs> then they, the, the whole downstream thing starts. TLR agonists induce the maturation of dendritic cells, activate the immune system. We're working with panthrocis, which is a lipoprotein for, as a uh, receptor agonist for TLR2. Uh, it favors Th2 production of antibodies. And we were, we were working with I, Imiquimod, 
which actually used in the treatment of skin cancer, um, a TLR7 ligand for viral recognition which favors TH1 and cellular immune response. So what we thought maybe these two may get into a synergy if we gave two at the same time, maybe we get a better or different immune response. So as I said, the uh, mucosal immunization is a real challenge. Uh, protective mucosal immune responses are most effectively induced by mucosal immunization. However, it requires novel vaccine strategies and activating probably multiple arms of the innate and adaptive immune systems like we try to do by using several toll-like receptor agonists. Now, as I said, this is a real challenge. Uh, most effectively, these are, we had some successes here uh, for the polio virus, the influenza virus. Uh, there is some, some um, um, results with uh, mucosal uh, vaccination, as is for the measles vaccine that has been tested in a couple of thousand of um, <coughs> infants, of, of, of children. Um, measles vaccination by, by inhalation in different trials. There are <coughs> many more still pending, of course. Mycobacterium tuberculosis against tuberculosis, which we were focusing on, HIV, herpes virus, and so forth. So there might be some <coughs> small successes. However, the, the major um, pathogens are still out there and uh, waiting to, to find their vaccine, uh, effective vaccine for mucosal uh, vaccination. Now, the use of these nanoparticles is uh, for the mucosal application of vaccines, uh, you can find a couple of uh, advantages here. So it protects the antigen against degradation. If you think of uh, DNA vaccines, if you think of protein vaccines, so these must be protected against degradation before it comes to an uptake by um, the antigen presenting cells. You want to avoid dilution on the mucosa of the antigen, so you want to have it in one place at a high concentration so the immune system can really see that there is something out there and, and uh, respond to this. What you may <coughs> build into your systems is the targeting of certain cells, um, most of all these antigen presenting cells, because they are then the ones responsible for um, the activation of the immune system. <coughs> you want to increase the antigen uptake by immune cells, so what we're always looking at is like are these nanoparticles taken up by our immune cells or not, or to what ex which extent, so to really have a good uptake, a high uptake, to load these cells with uh, um, sufficient uh, quantities of the vaccine, or the antigen, let's say. So there are failed attempts using synthetic biodegradable uh, nanoparticles like these uh, polyelectric glycolite acid uh, PLA uh, nanoparticles. There was no induction of dendritic cell maturation in vitro. So there was a strategy in order to increase this or even to get something um, to add some immunostimulatory molecules, some adjuvants, some specific uh, molecules to induce uh, an immune response with these particles. And then we asked the question whether a combination of different ligands here, PRRs, might have a synergistic effect. So um, I'm skipping this a little. Yes, I'll come right to the point. So the generation that we, uh, we envision is like something like, a, like the structure, like an artificial virus, if you want. It's a particulate in a particulate form. You have some vaccine antigens here, which may be recombinant protein antigens or genes uh, delivered as antigens. So you may have just the DNA and the... Um, the genetic information for an antigen that's later then produced by the host himself. You have the delivery system, which was before mineral salts or alum. Today we're talking more in the direction of nanotechnology or microtechnology, so micro and nanoparticles. Might be emulsions, liposomes and virosomes and VLPs these days are subsumized under the, the, the title here, nanoparticles, if you go to an immunologists or vaccinologists um, meeting, 70% of the presentations are all about nanoparticles. Um, so, but however, what, what we're trying to say is that you should try to stay in a certain size range and that these delivery systems should be in a particulate form in order to be recognized by the immune system. 
<coughs> then we would like to add some danger signals, like these TLR ligands that show to the immune system, hey, there's, a, um, there's an antigen coming up, so you better recognize this and, and do something about it. And we were t working with uh, toll-like receptor ligands and not like receptor ligands here. We incorporate them as well in this in these systems, and then you may think about immune potentiators like all these substances that give you a, another boost or an activation of the immune system, which may or may not be um, specific ligands for certain uh, pathogen, pathogenic uh, pattern recognition receptors. Now, before you go and do this uh, in animals, what we were interested in was you know, if we now give a vaccine by the pulmonary route of application, by inhalation, what happens? Where does, do these particles end up? How are they taken up? Which cells are taking this up? And so we got into collaboration with the University of Bern uh, Department of, for Pathology, uh, Peter Gehr and uh, Barbara Roten there, um, who had developed um, a cell model for the human airway barrier. So basically what you do is you have this in vitro, this cell culture with epithelial cells here, um, cultured on a, on a porous membrane. Then you, after this has been um, grown to confluency, so you have tight junctions in between the epithelial cells, you turn the whole thing around and you, you culture some dendritic cells which we got from PBMCs, from human blood. <coughs> And we cultured them on the basolateral side, so on the downside here, underneath the epithelium, if you want. And then to finish this up, you add some uh, alveolar macrophages, which are also isolated, and put them on top of this epithelium here. So basically what you have here is a model of the human airway barrier. And then you can do all kinds of things. So this uh, resembles the... Um, the epithelial lining of the airways here in vivo. So you have these dendritic cells, the epithelial cells, the macrophages, dendritic cells here who can grab through these tight junctions and sample from the luminal area here, these particles that were put on it. Um, some of these um, epithelial cells actually produce mucus. So you have some mucus layer on it. They have ciliated cells. So they pretty much resemble what you have in, in, in vivo. And it might be a good model to be used to look at if you put now particles here, vaccine, nanoparticles on top, what happens to these nanoparticles. And we did that. Uh, study design was, this was just um, a DNA, nanoparticles, um, nothing on it. Then we had um, with a, no, this was, uh, this was just PGF, this was just green fluorescent uh, expressing uh, DNA. This was together with uh, the polymer, and there, here we put some danger signals on them. So in order to see the difference basically between the three there. And then we uh, sprayed this onto this, this cell model. So this is a sprayer, which you may recognize this has been used as a application device for small animals, for mice and for rats, endo tracheal application of aerosols. You can use this syringe here with a, with a tube and then you spray it directly onto this epithelial cell model. Like it's uh, described here, so you have the microsprayer here, you have the particles which then in, impact on this uh, cell culture model with the um, alveolar macrophages here and the epithelial cells and the dendritic cells. Now, and then we did some, some analysis. Um, did some uh, confocal laser um, microscopy studies. Uh, this is the view here. So we looked at the dendritic cells and looked at where the expression was for the three groups. And we saw that we saw some more uptake or more fluorescent expressed by the, uh, by the reported DNA in these cells. Now, and then we rendered this, of course. We could look at different... Uh, different structures and 3D, and there we saw some, some nice uh, expression of green fluorescent protein in different cell types. We did the same uh, for the uptake of MDCC, so for the dendritic cells on the 
basolateral site, and there also we saw after incubation, we saw some signals here. So indeed, these um, particles can actually penetrate this epithelial lining and then be taken up by dendritic cells. And this is also, I think, shown in this picture where you have here this dendritic cell there, and it's taken up these, uh, or it's showing signals of these particles. And um, when we looked at the uptake pattern in a like um, quantitative way, we saw there's a lot, <clears throat> not much been taken up by the epithelial cells, not much by the dendritic cells, although we saw some signals even at the basal lateral side, most of, the, uh, of these, these particles were actually taken up by uh, the macrophages in this case. And then we looked at uh, immune responses, like immune response IL-8. We measured the IL-8 response for the one without the um, danger signal that was not significantly different from the control groups here. But however, when we equipped the whole thing with uh, a danger signal in this case, then we got a little more activity or IL-8 um, um, production, secretion by these cells in the cell model, the same for TNF-alpha as well. So here we saw that, you know, this has been taken up, and not only these particles have been taken up, but they elicited in vitro a certain immune response by various cell types. And we looked also at the distribution in the cell types, and not very surprisingly, we saw the most in the macrophages on the apical side of the monolayer. However, we also saw some interaction of the dendritic cells in the lower uh, part of the, uh, of the epithelial barrier. Now, when we summarize this, so we, we made this polymer that we used to make the particles rather successfully with a TLR12 ligand. We formulated that into DNA containing nanoparticles, the pDNA, the reported DNA, gene green fluorescent protein of this size, 400 nanometers, could protect the plasmid against degradation and so forth. And then in the end, we saw some immunogenicity in THP1 cells to produce a certain um, amount of IL-4, uh, IL-8 secretions, sorry, IL-8 secretions in this cell model uh, that I just described. For the uh, bronchial pulmonary or bronchial PNDNA uh, vaccination, some of these particles contributed to an overall higher adjuvanticity, protection against enzymatic degradation, transfection in vitro, transport of DNA into the most competent APC type, namely the uh, dendritic cells on the lower <coughs> level on the uh, basolateral side of the, the epithelium. And overall, we saw an increase in the immune response, at least in vitro here. So this is what we did for that. So we had one toll-like receptor ligand there equipped on these nanoparticles, showed some nice results. Then we went on and said, hey, why not you know, move ahead and combine two different ligands from two different pathways? And here you see a, um, a formulation we made with the, um, the particles here. We included, um, we included two ligands, one TLR9 ligand, which is um, a um, receptor ligand for the TLR9 receptor, which is expressed intracellularly in the endosomes. And we included not two ligand, muramal uh, dipeptide, which is interacting with the cytosolic receptors. And so here you see you have two different ways of activating the immune system. One is through this myd 88 activation, IRAC, TRAF, and so forth, in order to produce um, interferon alpha, beta, and so forth. The other one is through the NOT2 via this RIP2, um, IRF3, uh, and a NF-kappa-B pathway in order to produce pro-inflammatory pro cytokines. So from this, we thought maybe we can get something like a additional or complementary activation of the immune system. Now, we used this. Oops. So the presentation of the project was like, okay, was the, uh, the aim of, was the preparation, characterization, and in vitro testing of particulate carrier systems 
able to target and stimulate immune cells by a combination of different PRR ligands. So the vector was alkydazon again, we, which we used in, as nanoparticle form. But what we also did, we included a emulsion formulation, so squalene in water emulsion, nanodroplets. And the, the third vector we used was cut your norm. This is a emulsion that's on the market that you can buy. We did this, and then we, we added the antigen, which was AG85A, my, uh, it's a, um, a protein of mycobacterium tuberculosis, so an antigen of mycobacterium tuberculosis, the DNA expressing this, um, this antigen. So we had now the immunostimulator 1, unmethylated CPG sequences of this DNA, which was um, expressing the AG85A. And the next thing, the next immunostimulator was this, the MDP, not two ligand, which we then added to these three formulations. Now we did this, um, we added this cationome and we added this qualine in water emulsion nanodroplets because we have a collaboration with the um, WHO vaccine formulation laboratory in Lausanne. And they're always looking at, you know, getting, developing easy, relatively easy formulations for vaccines that could be stable under the conditions in, in developing countries that can e even be developed and formulated in these countries under relatively easy circumstances, so sim simply uh, simple uh, circumstances. Now, just to tell you about this, the first vector we used, the nanoparticle preparation, we used this TMC that you see here, that's a polymer which has some positively charged amine groups and some other groups here at uh, the other, at the amine. So you can use chitosan, you get the trimethyl chitosan, which is positively charged. And this you can add to the DNA, so the negatively charged DNA would then <clears throat> interact with your chitosan in order to form, through complex coacervation method, these, these nanoparticles that you see here. The mean size of these particles was about 280 nanometers and uh, with a, I think, a positive uh, surface charge in the end. Now, the second nanoparticle preparation, the oil in water emulsion preparation, we had distilled water, we had some uh, surfactants here, and we had 5% squalene as an adjuvant. Put this all together with a positive um, phospholipid. Homogenized at high speeds and did a high shear processing by a microfluidizer, and we came up with these droplets, oil, water, and then you had this span, this tween, the squalene all around here in this in this mixture of these these uh, emulsion droplets. And here you see the mean size of these droplets was 129 nanometers in diameter. Now, the third thing we used was uh, cationorm, oil and water emulsion, mineral oil. We have a cationic agent, citalconium chloride, some surfactants, and water for injection. Here you see the, <clears throat> the product as it comes out of the, out of the bottle. And there, then we measured uh, the size and zeta potential for all nanocarriers after we, we added the, uh, the DNA and before. So for instance, for our nanoparticles made from trimethyl chitosan, you see that the, <clears throat> the size increased, the zeta potential dropped to 16.9 approximately. For the dot up here, for the emulsions, we saw also an increase to 165 nanometers, a drop quite significantly to a negative charge. And for the um, cation norm we use with the PDNA, there also we saw an increase in the droplet size and a large drop in the zeta potential. So these were the things that we had to test for in the toxicity profiles. Now, we used for toxicity profiling of these nanocarriers, we used a raw 264.7 uh, murine macrophage cell line used that these, these um, formulations at different dilutions. Here is shown as 1 to 10 dilution. 
We incubated for 24 hours and then we evaluated toxicity by XTT. And you basically see that <coughs> for um, these, the PDNA alone was more toxic than actually all of the other nanoparticle formulations here. So we were well above a threshold of about 70 percent uh, cell survival, which indicates that there is low toxicity for all these carriers, at least in this uh, cell line and at least under the conditions we tested it. Now the immunogenicity of these functionalized PDNA nanocarriers, again in vitro, <coughs> for these murine macrophages. We uh, looked here at the release of TNF-alpha. Uh, in this case, and you see, if you go from here, the DNA and the MDP didn't do much. The nanoparticles plus DNA separately, or the nanoparticles and MDP separately, or the nanoparticles and MDP DNA, only then you saw <coughs> an, uh, somewhat an increase. This is the, uh, the positive control LPS. And if you now go to this cut your norm, so this uh, product that we took off the, from the market, we mix it with PDNA and with the MDP, with the, with the ligand, then we, we see quite an increase in the signal of TNF-alpha here. So we had very significant increases over cut your norm with only PDNA or cut your norm only with the MDP. So that was a nice signal we get from the murine macrophages. And also what, you need, what, you, what it shows is that, sorry, I go back, um, that you have actually an increase over uh, the addition of the two effects, but you rather have something of a more than additional, more than an additional um, activation. You have a synergistic effect of the two um, toll-like and not two receptor ligands here. Then we looked at the uptake of these functionalized PDNA carriers, again, in a human alveolar basal epithelial cell line, A549. Uh, dilution incubation time was overnight, about 8 to 10 hours, and we evaluated that by confocal microscopy. And here you see <coughs> the uh, GFP, the green fluorescent protein, PDNA was labeled in green. The MDP rhodum was labeled with rhodum in, so the, uh, the um, ligand was labeled with a red fluorescent, and if you have the overlay here, you see that you get both the... Um, the, the green fluorescent and the red uh, signal in the same place, so both of these ligands were taken up by cells and were in the same place at the same time. So, coming to the summary. <clears throat> these DNA vaccine formulations that we dis developed were shown to be safe under the conditions I described, so not much toxicity until now. Uh, they resulted in an increase of pro-inflammatory cytokine release by targeting the TLR9 and then NLR2 receptors, elicited a synergistic, not only additional, but synergistic enhancement as a result of delivering two innate immune receptor ligands at the same time, and uptake in protein expression has been confirmed, so we know that these things are actually taken up by the cells. Perspectives. <clears throat> there are a couple of answer, questions to be answered. Um, first is that we need to repeat the synergistic studies. We did that in the meantime, and we saw that, yes, this is really a synergistic effect. So we wanted to be really sure that this was a synergistic effect. And then the second one would be more an academic uh, question, would be to how do the ligands get into the cell, into the nucleus? When and where is this not two ligand release? Is this extracellularly? Is it intracellularly after uptake? Where does this work? Is it in the endosome? So what we'd like to know is where these ligands are actually um, exposed to the immune system. So we'd like to investigate the uptake, uh, investigate the, the uptake mechanisms, and that's currently going on. The second thing we'd like to do is in vivo studies in BAPC mice, it's immunological model for Th1 response, and then we, in cooperation with, uh, with Lausanne, we'd like to use NOT2 knockout mice, which do not have the NOT2 receptor, in order to knock out the NOT2 signal, and then also in vivo verify or confirm the synergistic effect of non-2 receptor dependent immune response. These studies are currently going on. <clears throat> we, uh, 
we uh, just finished the study and we're working on the, uh, on the results and on the, the sera and the samples and everything. So we looked at the increase of anti AG 85A antibodies by ELISA on serum. So we looked at the immune response against this, anti, this, this uh, antigen that's been expressed by this um, DNA we were using. So we're looking at total IgG specific. Then the cellular responses, we isolate the spleen and we look at uh, ex vivo protein stimulation, lymphocyte proliferation, fax and, and LISPOT. LISPOT actually turned out to be one of the best methods we had there in this, in this way and we saw some um, very good results uh, in this case. And this is currently going on in our labs and at, at Lausanne. And we're very um, enthusiastic about this. First uh, results show that we could repeat what we s saw in vitro, but now we have to really work on the data and then publish this as soon as possible. So last slide here are my acknowledgements. Uh, University of Geneva, Vaccine Formulation Lab, and the Institute of Biology and Chemistry of Proteins uh, in, in Lyon in France also helped us. Um, we, uh, the uh, Vaccine Formulation Laboratory at the U University of Lausanne. Here are some people from my group, X or still there. This is uh, from the Vaccine Formulation Laboratory and this is a former PhD student or postdoc of mine who's now working at IBCP. And everything that I'm left with is to Thank you for your attention.